Welcome everybody, I'm Mark Massa. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual Wolf Lecture, named in honor of my revered predecessor of, as director of the Blasey Center, Alan Allen. And you need to stand up, please. So it's like, um, for those of you who know uh, a little about politics, you'll know that Alan is a major voice in American political discussions and he's appeared on all kind of uh, social media and television, so we're delighted that you're with us and honored. Our two, two speakers today are stars in their own right, and I'm glad that we got them when we did. Kay Lehman Schlossman is the Joseph Mookley Endowed Professor of Political Science here at Boston College. Among her numerous publications, it's a long publication. Kay is the co-author of Unequal and Un Underrepresented Political Inequality and the People's Voice in the New Gilded Age, The Unheavenly Course, Unequal Political Voice, and the Broken Promise of American Democracy, which won two prose awards from the American Association of Publishers, and The Private Roots of Public Action, Gender Equality and Political Participation, which was a co-winner of the American Political Science Association's Shock Prize. She is the editor of Elections in America and co-editor of The Future of Political Science. And she is, among her many accomplishments, a member of the most elite social club in the United States called the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which was, was it John Adams? I think it was founded by John Adams in 1791. I think it was Hancock, actually. It was? I think it was Hancock. Okay. David Hopkins is Associate Professor in the Political Science Department, whose research and teaching interests include American political parties and elections, Congress, voting behavior, public opinion, media and culture, and research methods. He is the author of, among many other things, Red Fighting Blue, How Geography and Electoral Rules Polarize American Politics, published by Cambridge University Press. Asymmetric Politics, Ideological Republicans and Group Interest Democrats, published by Oxford, which won the 2018 Leon Epstein Outstanding Book Award from the American Political Science Association. He is also the co-editor of The Forum, a journal of applied research in contemporary politics. It has contributed to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Vox. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers. Okay, David, do you have a order of preferred order in which you want to do this? I do that. Okay, good. Uh, the order of service will be 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up to all of you for your questions. So. It's an honor to deliver a lecture named for my esteemed emeritus colleague, Alan Wolf and to share the podium with my also esteemed colleague, David Hopkins. As expected, David and I will each talk about aspects of the multiple ways that religion and politics intersect for those in the pews. I'm going to ask, at a time of nearly unprecedented partisan competition and animosity, what are the religious affiliations and commitments of those who support each of our two major parties? Which means that all those beautiful posters like that one that you saw on campus and that lured you into this room got you here under false pretenses. Because instead of discussing the parties and the pews, in a way, I'm going to discuss the pews and the parties. Dave's going to flip your expectations in a different way the ordinary frame for understanding the relationship between the religious and political for ordinary citizens is that faith precedes politics. But Dave's going to demonstrate that these days the relationship is also reciprocal and that political loyalties and choices also shape religious identities and commitments. So understanding the religious affiliations and commitments of those who support each of our two parties um, requires us, alas, to build a fair amount of intellectual scaffolding, and I'm going to have to get, I apologize, into the weeds. 
So we need to do two things before we can answer the question. First, we have to look at the changing distribution of, um, of the public into various religious denominations and consider those who are not denominationally affiliated at all. The second thing we have to do is we have to look at the changing ties between those denominationally affiliated and unaffiliated folks and the homes. So the first thing I'm going to do is sketch out the changing landscape of religious affiliations and commitments. Um, the changing distribution of religious affiliations reflects the intersection of several processes, all of which not only change over time, but are different among different denominations. So first of all, people switch. You grow up in a household that has one set of religious commitments, and maybe when you're in your 20s, you decide that's not for you. And switching tends to happen when people are young. We also see the effects of migration, people coming to and leaving the United States, and which has, of course, been more people coming in the last couple of generations than people leaving. And finally, we have to think about generational replacement. But even if nobody changes their mind and you know, nobody comes and goes, people move through the life cycle. They enter adulthood, eventually, alas, they leave. And with that, has, that brings changing denominational distribution, especially since the people in different denominations don't have equal birth rates and they don't have an equal capacity to pass along to the next generation their religious affiliations and identities. So the borders of the map that I'm going to quickly sketch out have changed quite a bit in the last third of the century. Today, the US is roughly two thirds Christian. And that's down from about 90% in the 1990s. <coughs> so let's start with Catholics. They have, over the last couple of generations, lost both adherence and share of the total population. As of 2018, Roughly one in eight American adults was a former Catholic, and 2% of American adults were um, Catholic converts, now Catholic, who came from, from elsewhere. Catholic losses among native-born Americans have been offset by immigration of Catholics, especially from Central and South America, during the, and especially during the 1990s. Today, Roughly 40% of Catholics are Latinos. There's some affinities between what I just told you for, for American Catholics and mainline Protestants. These are people in denominations like Methodists, Episcopalians, most Lutherans, most Presbyterians. They too have lost adherence and shares of population among white affiliates. In contrast, blacks affiliated with, historical, with historically black mainline denominations like AMEZ, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, or with other mainline uh, Protestant denominations that are not historically black, those numbers have actually held up. When we get to evangelical Protestants, it gets really complicated. Evangelicalism is the school of Protestant Christianity that emphasizes personal salvation through Jesus Christ and regards the Bible as the final authority in matters of faith and practice. We can't talk about evangelicals without differentiating by race and ethnicity. Among non-Hispanic white evangelicals, these are folks who are affiliated with um, denominations like Southern Baptists, Assemblies of God, Missouri Lutherans, uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans. There are lots and lots of evangelical Protest white evangelical Protestant denominations, although we should notice 
that increasing numbers of non-Hispanic white evangelicals actually worship in independent, non-denominational Christian churches. It's a kind of new phenomenon. Uh, there's some disagreement among the surveys of, of religious affiliations, but it seems that among white evangelicals, after holding their own for a long time, as the numbers of Catholics and mainline Protestants among whites diminished, they too have now become a smaller share of the adult population. That's roughly something that happened over the last decade. It's really important to know that not all evangelical Protestants are white. Um, the plurality of blacks in the US are evangelical Protestants. They tend to be in different denominations from the white evangelical denominations, and their numbers are holding up. The, the group that is growing is Latino evangelicals. They are outnumbered roughly two to one by Latino Catholics, but they are predominantly converts from Catholicism. In addition to these sort of three big religious groupings, Catholics, mainline Protestants, evangelical Protestants, there are lots of smaller ones. There are Jews, as well as increasing minorities, small groups of adherence to such non-Christian faiths as Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims. And they have been augmented through, through immigration. But the religious, biggest religious denomination, I can call it that, is the unaffiliated. Those who describe themselves as, when they're asked by a pollster, you know, what is their religious identity or affiliation, they call themselves atheists, agnostics, or in particular, they'll say nothing in particular, which um, leads pollsters sometimes to call them nuns, N-O-N-E-S. The number and share of nuns, that is those who have no de denominational affiliation, has soared in recent years. And this group now is roughly a quarter of all American adults, and it's greater in number than all the mainline Protestants, all the white evangelicals, or all of the Catholics. Catholics including other Catholics of any race or ethnicity. One thing that's important to know about the non-affiliated is that they're not necessarily uniform with respect to religious faith or practice. There are actually, they're not necessarily non-believers. There are, quote, unchurched believers. However, compared to those with to those who identify with a denomination, they are much more likely to embrace science, to espouse a secular, rationalistic, and hu or humanistic version of what are the ultimate sources of truth. They are also much less likely to attend religious services. In fact, I should say as a corollary, it's very important for us to know that both religious attendance as well as religious belief and individual religious practices, like praying every day, for example, have diminished, again, in the last roughly third of the century. <coughs> and that these trends are not simply a function of there being more non-affiliates among the adult population. They are characteristics, characteristic of uh, the adherence of a number of major denominations. Returning to these non-affiliated, they are much more likely to be well-educated, white, and young. And because the unaffiliated are very disproportionately young, it means that the share of the population that is unaffiliated is likely to grow over time as they move through the life cycle and are replacing fogies like me who are going to leave before they do. 
Um, and the ultimate bottom line is that at some point in our current century, the nation will not no longer be a majority Christian. When that happens, the, uh, the analysts of sort of religion and society differ, and it depends exactly how you model it. But that is the, uh, the conclusion they draw. So that's a very quick version of what is the religious map in the US. So now, what about the party loyalties of all these denominations and groups? That the members of different denominational uh, groups have different political habits and different party loyalties is nothing new. It goes back, we can find it in the late um, 18th century. Federalists and Republicans drew from different religious and ethnic groups. I'm happy to talk about that later. But um, this is nothing new. The story after the New Deal coalition that governed our politics for so many <coughs> decades was that beneath the class-based coalitions was a difference between Catholics and Protestants. Protestants affiliated with the Republican Party, Catholics with the Democratic Party. And then in the early 1970s, we got a new version. And that was that it wasn't about denomination that differentiated the parties. It was about the difference between, in terms of religiosity, between the churched and the unchurched. Something that was sometimes called the God gap, with Republicans on average much more likely to be religiously faithful than on average Democrats. But now, just like everything I'm telling you, it's gotten a lot more complicated. And the bottom line is that the the Democrats are more religiously diverse, both in terms of denomination and religious religiosity than our Republicans. So let's run through the groups I talked about before very quickly. Um, I mentioned that Catholics were long a critical part of the New Deal coalition for the Democrats. Catholics are no longer a cohesive block in American politics. They are a swing consistency, excuse me, a swing constituency. White Catholics lean Republican. Latino Catholics uh, lean relatively strongly in a democratic direction, but we should notice that there are nationality differences among Latino Catholics. So those whose home countries were you know, Cuban Americans and more recently immigrants from South America, especially from Venezuela, are more likely to be Republicans than, um, for example, Mexican Americans. Mainline Protestants, the counterpart of the Catholics, a traditional core of the Republican coalition. And here we've seen real change, especially as their numbers have diminished. Their ties to the Republicans remain, but are much more attenuated than they were a generation or two ago. Then we get, of course, to evangelical Protestants. And once again, it's really complicated. Um, for non-Hispanic white evangelicals, for a very long time, their political posture was characterized by relative political quiescence, as well as divided party loyalties. So if you think of the Bible Belt in the United States as a kind of L, the part, in the part of the L that went north-south through the Great Plains, the white evangelical Protestants were strongly Republican. But when the, the L turned east and went through the south, traditionally white evangelical Protestants were democratic in the south. And that configuration has changed dramatically. Southern white evangelicals have largely uh, abandoned the Democrats. And other than Mormons, white evangelicals are probably the most loyal religious group in the public. And in fact, the modal Republican is now a white evangelical. And this switch 
has had profound consequences for our politics in that it has rendered the two parties evenly matched electorally, which has had an enormous consequence on party polarization and the animosity between the parties. We mentioned that most blacks are evangelical Protestants, and they are a very loyal democratic group and they are an essential part of the democratic coalition. They are church going um, and, and faithful and one of the important exceptions to the generalization of the Democrats being some kind of godless party. One concern the Democrats have for the future is the extent to which within the Democratic Party, increasing numbers of secular white Democrats might be in conflict, it would be a fault line, with religiously committed black evangelicals, both very important parts of the democratic coalition these days. Latino evangelicals are substantially less democratic than Latino Catholics, but they are more democratic than their white, their non-Hispanic white uh, evangelical counterparts. I mentioned Mormons a few minutes ago. They are a relatively small and geographically concentrated group, and they are very, very loyal to the Republicans. And although they don't constitute a big piece of the Republican Party, it's really important when the parties are as evenly balanced as our, they are, as our parties are now that to have that kind of very loyal group. Um, Jewish voters, are an even smaller group than Mormons. They are, have had strong ties to the Democratic Party that date to the New Deal, although there are Jewish Republicans among both Orthodox Jews as well as conservative Zionists who prioritize support for hardline policies in Israel. Muslims are an even smaller group. They are quite diverse the religious group with American born adherents who have uh, of the nation who are adherents of the nation of Islam, um, black Muslims, as well as those with immigrant roots in Arab countries, Asia, and sub Saharan Africa. They are a somewhat democratic group and have moved in a more democratic um, direction since the beginning of this century. Finally, our friends, the unaffiliated, um, they lead strongly in the democratic direction um, as, and as unaffiliated and seculars become a more important part of the democratic coalition. There's possible friction, again, with blacks and Latino Democrats. Um, and with all uh, Democrats of greater religious commitment and um, perhaps more limited education and, and the working class white Democrats who are left. We should note that we've talked about the unaffiliated as being a, an important part of the Democratic coalition, but there are Republican sec seculars. There are Republicans who are not religiously affiliated, and they tend to be of a libertarian bent and they do differ with their fellow partisans, among them, especially among white evangelicals, in terms of their issue, their issue positions on cultural issues. So to summarize, what does this mean about each party coalition? A quick summary statement is that the Republicans are a party of white Christians, and the Democrats are religiously diverse. Both major parties are now majority Christian, roughly five and six Republicans, and two thirds of the Democrats identify as Christian. And that there's a much bigger difference, however, in terms of the party difference with the proportion of their, the people in their coalition who are Christians of color. The Democrat 
in among Democrats, two thirds, excuse me, roughly four in 10 Democrats are white Christians. But in contrast, roughly two thirds of Republicans are white Christians. And that's a big difference. And a, over a quarter of Democrats and less than 10% of Republicans are persons of color who are Christian. Going back to the religiously unaffiliated, roughly one in four Democrats is religiously unaffiliated and um, compared to roughly one in eight for Republicans. So the unaffiliated are a much more important piece of the action for Democrats than for Republicans. So to repeat the conclusion about the pews in the parties, the Republicans are a party of white Christians and the Democrats are religiously diverse. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here. And in particular, it's, a, it's an honor to be here at the, the Wolf Lecture uh, in honor of my uh, my emeritus colleague, uh, uh, Professor Wolf, and it's and it's great to be here with um, another one of my my valued colleagues, Professor Schlossman, to talk about um, what I think is one of the more interesting in a field of interesting questions that American politics today is is providing us. And uh, I'm going to, as <coughs> promised, focus uh, on the relationship between politics and religion in a different way than it is often discussed. Often, we discuss religion as the source of citizens' political ideas, commitments, and identities. And um, I'm here to argue that sometimes it goes the other way around. Now, why is it that we usually think of citizens' religion as affecting their political identity rather than vice versa? Um, I think of, there are probably three common assumptions that undergo, undergird that. Uh, first, we assume that religious identity is formed first. It's formed often in young life. We're socialized by our parents uh, into a particular uh, religious tradition, and we really reach full membership in that religious community as, as an adult uh, prior to the period at which we reach full adult membership in the political community. Second, we often assume that religious beliefs and identities are assumed to be more personally central than political affiliations. Uh, so if a conflict arises between them, the political self will adapt to conform to the religious self rather than the other way around. And third, we often assume that religious identities are more strongly reinforced by our social relationships and communities, our spouse, our children, our family, our friends, compared to political identities. But a growing amount of academic evidence suggests that this is not always true. That for some Americans, political identities are influencing religious identities as well. And this is important not just because, oh, some of us are social scientists who care a lot about cause and effect and why do people tick and how do people develop politically and all of that. It's also important because there's reason to believe that the effect of political identity on religious identity is itself working to deepen social divisions and party polarization in the American public today. So let's re-examine those three assumptions in the light of current American life. Um, first, though, though it's true that most Americans are socialized into religious faith as children, it's also very common for people to move away from religion during adolescence and young adulthood returning to religious institutions if they do, after they have married and had children of their own. But during that time away from religion, that time, that period of life in adolescence and young adulthood, they're forming political identities. And so it's then natural that those political identities will then affect their later decision about whether to return to the faith of their youth, to choose a different faith, or to opt for none at all. And these days, with Americans marrying and having children later and later in life on average, their political identities have even more time to form before they reach that stage. 
Research by political scientist Michelle Margolis has found that the partisan gap in church attendance, Republicans go more often than Democrats, is partially due to the fact that while members of both parties become less likely to attend church after childhood, Republicans are more likely than Democrats to resume attendance once they have children of school age. Margolis also found that Democrats are more likely than Republicans to stop attending church during the presidency of George W. Bush, a conspicuously religious conservative Republican leader. How about the second assumption? Now, political affiliations themselves certainly have become increasingly central to American sense of self, to the extent that even religious beliefs or identities can shift to accommodate them. On one side, we've seen conservatives increasingly embrace the evangelical Christian label, even if they don't subscribe to evangelical doctrine. And we've seen evangelical Christians embrace political leaders who do not comport themselves with the personal piety and probity that their religious faith normally prizes. On the other hand, we've also seen an encroaching number of Democrats and liberals react to the argument that you need to hold certain socially conservative political positions in order to be a, a, a good Christian by responding that those positions are inconsistent with their own personal values. And if that's what it means to be a Christian, maybe they're not a Christian after all. Finally, the increasing correlation of partisanship with ethnicity, education, geography, and generation means that Americans are likely to socially associate mostly with other people who share their political predispositions. And this behavior further fuels the perception that members of the other party are fundamentally different than ourselves. They're them rather than us. And this helps explain the rise of what scholars call affective polarization, the growing gap between the positive feelings that Americans have for their own partisan or ideological allies and the antipathy they maintain for the other side. As political scientist Patrick Egan puts it, Republican and Democrat, as well as liberal and conservative, have become more than just bundles of policy preferences. They are also increasingly taking on the quality of strong social identities. Liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans prefer to be friends with, date, marry, work and do business with, and be neighbors with their own group. This means that political identity is increasingly reinforced by social relationships and networks, just as religious identity can be. In fact, Americans' preference to remain among their own kind is now much more evident in the political rather than the religious realm. Disapproval of religious intermarriage, once prevalent in American society, my own Catholic grandfather and Protestant grandmother scandalized their relatives by marrying in the 1940s, well, that's now rare. That's mostly gone. But while only 5% of Americans in 1960 said they would be upset if their child married someone of the opposite party, by 2010, this figure had risen to 40%. And 52% of Americans now say that they themselves would not wish to marry a member of the other party. Americans perceive the nation to be more politically divided than it once was. And in particular, they perceive it to be more politically divided along religious lines. Most citizens now view Republicans as the party of Christianity, especially evangelical Christianity, and Democrats as the party of non-Christians and the non-religious. In fact, research by political scientists Doug Aller and Gorov Sood finds that Americans of both parties significantly overestimate how many Republicans are evangelical Christians and how many Democrats are non-religious, meaning that the magnitude of party differences is even greater in the imaginations of citizens than it is in reality. These perceptions can be self-fulfilling in two ways. They can convince loyal believers or non-believers to sort themselves into the party that matches their existing religious affiliation. But they can also encourage loyal partisans to sort themselves into the religious category that matches their existing political affiliation. Either way, the result is the same. Political and religious boundaries in the American public that grow to reinforce each other, leading to deeper social divisions. So how are these trends affected each of the parties? Let's start with the Republicans. 
Since the mobilization of the religious right in the 1980s and 90s, evangelical Christianity has become popularly identified with conservative republicanism and vice versa. One consequence of this development has been to encourage the migration of white evangelicals, many of whom, especially in the South, were once Democrats, into the Republican Party, as, as Kay mentioned. Now white evangelicals are the GOP's most loyal supporters. Between 75 and 80 percent of white evangelicals voted Republican in the last several national elections. But the adoption of an evangelical Christian identity has now itself become a political act separable from actual patterns of religious practice. White conservatives have become more likely to report to pollsters that they consider themselves to be evangelical, even if they don't go to church or subscribe to the specific religious tenets associated with evangelical doctrine. According to political scientist Ryan Berge, the share of Americans identifying as evangelical Christians increased over the course of Donald Trump's presidency with Trump supporters more likely than Trump opponents to adopt an evangelical identity. Now, this trend doesn't seem to reflect any new wave of religious devotion or conversion, with adherents spreading the gospel to previous non-believers. Instead, it has arisen from conservative Americans' increasing proclivity to view the evangelical label as a political category with which they wish to associate themselves. In fact, the number of self-described evangelicals who also say they seldom or never attend church rose from 16 to 27 percent between 2008 and 2020. An increasing number of these non-attending evangelicals identify as political conservatives. That the evangelical identity has become something other than a reflection of specific religious belief is also reflected by the fact that the number of Catholics who call themselves evangelical or born again is also on the rise in America, up to 15% as of 2018. The practice of shifting one's religious identity to better fit one's political identity has even extended to one famous Christian in particular who does not often attend church, Donald Trump. Trump has not publicly claimed to be an evangelical, but he did announce shortly before the 2020 election that although he had previously identified with the Presbyterian church of his Scottish mother, he is no longer a mainline Protestant, but now considers himself a non-denominational Christian. This gives him a religious identity that is more in common with his evangelical supporters, many of whom, as Kay mentioned, also are non-denominational. Evangelical support for Trump has sometimes mystified people who view evangelicals as demanding evidence of religious devotion from their leaders and as maintaining strict standards for other forms of personal behavior. But it makes a lot of sense through the lens of politics. Trump took the policy positions valued by evangelicals on issues like abortion, made executive and judicial appointments that gained their approval, and battled the same set of opponents, liberals, journalists, intellectuals, feminists, and so on. Rather than appealing to moral teachings or discussing his personal faith, Trump successfully found common ground with his evangelical supporters by emphasizing a shared sense of alienation with the prevailing uh, direction of American culture, claiming, for example, that under his presidency, you can say Merry Christmas again and calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States, which turned into a travel ban on citizens from seven countries implemented immediately after he became president. There were, of course, evangelical leaders who were indifferent to or disgusted even by Trump, but they often found that their followers were more committed to Trump than they were to them. As one Michigan pastor explained to Tim Alberta of The Atlantic, I have them for 45 minutes on Sunday morning. Rush Limbaugh has them for three hours a day, and Fox has them every night. The religious marketplace seems to be encouraging the pastors of evangelical churches to emphasize conservative politics in general and support for Trump-style populism in particular, which of course has had the effect of encouraging any parishioners who don't agree with those positions to leave for another congregation or none at all. 
And the ability of political passions to override religious teachings in our current age is exemplified by the changing views of evangelicals during the Trump years on the question of how important it is for political leaders to set a moral example for the nation with their personal behavior. In 2011, 60% of white evangelicals agreed that public officials who commit an immoral act in their private lives cannot be trusted to behave ethically and fulfill their duties in their public and professional lives. By 2018, this number had dropped to 17%. And at the same time, people with no religious affiliation became seven points more likely to agree with that statement during the same period, testifying to Trump's unique knack to provoke people on both sides to view any political question through his gravitational field. Now let's turn to the Democrats. The increasing identification of organized Christianity with political conservatism since the 1980s has had the effect of alienating a number of more liberal citizens from the church. It's not an accident that the visible mobilization of the Christian right over the last few decades has occurred at the same time as a rise in the formerly modest number of Americans who claim no religious affiliation. Younger white liberals are the demographic group most likely to reject identifying with an organized religion, even if they maintain spiritual beliefs. And people who say they aren't members of a religion aren't necessarily atheists. 20% of the religious nuns, uh, uh, as Kay discussed, say they are certain that God exists, and another 30% believe in a higher power of some kind. Panel studies that measure the attitudes and behavior of the same group of subjects over time have confirmed that people who move away from religious affiliation over time are disproportionately likely to be Democrats. And experimental evidence demonstrates that Democrats presented with a news article featuring a highly religious Republican candidate are more likely than a comparison control group to then report being non-religious themselves. Another counter-response to the rise of the religious right is an attempt by more liberal denominations to separate themselves from the rising popular perception that Christianity is for conservatives. I'm sure many of you have had the experience of driving past a Unitarian or Congregational church and seeing a big rainbow flag outside or a Black Lives Matter sign on the lawn. That's a very visible way to say, don't worry, we're not that kind of Christian. But of course, these gestures also contribute to the growing emphasis on politics in American life and the treatment of religious identity as a product of political identity. Even Democrats who consider themselves religious believers are increasingly likely to subscribe to what political scientist David Campbell labels personal secularism. The view that the world is guided by the laws of nature and that human understanding and ethics should be based on reason, evidence, and scientific inquiry rather than religious authority or tradition. The well-educated liberals who are increasingly influential within democratic politics are especially likely to share this perspective. Campbell's research shows that at least half of democratic national convention delegates subscribe to a secularist worldview, and this share is growing over time. Democratic leaders like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, who are regular churchgoers and speak frequently about their personal religious beliefs and practices, are becoming rare. Newer generations of elected Democrats, with the partial exception of some black politicians, are less likely to invoke God or discuss their faith, even if they identify as members of a religious tradition. This makes the growing number of Democratic secularists feel at home in their party, but it also contributes to the wider perception that the Democratic Party as a whole can be indifferent, if not hostile, to religious belief and believers. So where does this leave us? The reciprocal, reciprocal relationship between religion and political identities demonstrates how polarization often has a self-reinforcing quality to it. As the perception of partisan divergence spreads, Citizens respond by sorting themselves into increasingly distinct partisan and religious categories, thus leading to still more partisan divergence and further waves of sorting. But this cycle of polarization is occurring during a period of significant long-term change. For the first time in history, white Christians no longer represent a majority of the American public, and at some point, 
as Kay mentioned, Christians of all right races will be outnumbered by the number of non-Christian and non-religious Americans. These trends are already changing our politics. Conservative Christian leaders, once very confident that they spoke for a moral majority, now exhibit a feeling of besiegement in the face of a changing American population and major social institutions that have mostly adopted secular norms. The relative optimism of the Reagan and even George W. Bush eras that the real America was firmly on the side of traditionalist Christianity has given way to perceptions of a nation in severe moral decay that is being fundamentally transformed into something unrecognizable by the forces of secular liberalism, justifying increasingly desperate measures to stop this trend. Scholars of religion and politics have started to focus on the rise of Christian nationalism, or the belief that the U.S. is properly a Christian nation and that radical steps should be taken to return Christian Christianity to primacy in order to remain in God's favor and preserve the national character. They view Christian nationalists, some of whom participated in the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol building, as now wielding a visible influence on conservative Republican politics, but perhaps a greater urgency as the country continues to diversify and secularize. According to the research of sociologists Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, citizens with Christian nationalist views are more likely than other Republicans or conservatives to have traditionalist positions on race, gender, and family issues, and to oppose immigration and the social integration of Muslims. Whitehead and Perry estimate that roughly half of American evangelicals embrace Christian nationalism to some degree. But the fact that Christian nationalism is not broadly accepted within the Republican coalition means that Republican leaders may need to manage internal conflict between nationalists and more conventional factions within the party. Democrats, too, are likely to find challenges in the future. The party is increasingly dependent on electoral support from non-white racial groups, especially black and Hispanic voters, who remain relatively observant and who maintain a different sensibility than the secular white liberals whose views and practices are increasingly influential, both within the party and across a broader array of American social institutions, from the educational system to the mainstream media. More generally, we should all be aware of the potential for religion and non-religion to reinforce existing political and social divisions rather than forming a distinct set of communities that cut across those boundaries. As time goes on, it may be harder to promote the view that what separates us as political beings is less important than what unites us as human beings. And religious institutions and moral leaders may find it more difficult to persuade citizens of an idea that many on both sides of the party divide these days find truly blasphemous, that there's more to the meaning of life than politics. <laughs> Thank you, Kay and David. Um, we're going to open this up to all of you uh, to your questions. I want to start with my own question. I'm, I'm a religious reader of The Atlantic, okay? And there's been a succession of articles in the, in the past three years in The Atlantic that says that the Democrats are bad at God talk. That, um, and that's a, a shame. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, who's a Methodist, lifelong Methodist, and uh, belonged in Washington to the Foundry Methodist Church, which is a very serious high-end church that demands that you tithe, that is, that 10% that everything you make has to go to the church, and also demands that you give 10 hours a week in social service, and there's actually a full-time minister. So Hillary Clinton, who's portrayed as sort of a godless woman, is very, was very religious and belonged to probably the church in Washington, D.C., that demanded more time than any other church. Likewise, uh, our current president, who's a Roman Catholic, is portrayed as God, God is, but we know for a fact that he carries a rosary around with him and says the rosary often during the day and goes to Mass more than just on Sundays, in fact. And I know the Jesuit pastor of Holy Trinity Church in Georgetown, which is his church, and says he goes often to daily Mass. The president goes off. And yet both Hillary Rodman Clinton and the current president are portrayed as godless by Republicans. Now, you addressed this to some extent, but so is this because of the abortion issue? Is it because of the fractious and divided nature of the Democratic Party itself, which, if they're too religious, will turn off some of their non-religious 
uh, advocates. How would you explain this fact that the, that the Democrats seem to have lost the ability to talk about God in public while the Republicans sort of glory in this? Either or both. Um, this is a great question. I, I do think it's probably more than one answer going on. Um, I do think that um, politicians on the Democratic side do feel, seem to feel a bit concerned that if they talk too much about religion or a specific religion, that it might alienate other people within their coalition. Um, and um, there's kind of a general exception made for black politicians that you know sort of consider that's part of you know black culture and, and black uh, political life. But for white politicians, you know, um, they they don't know. I think they they don't always feel like their own voters and their own party will will always be comfortable with that. I also think that yeah, you, you know, there. The, the 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 sort of the religious dimension in our partisan politics is I think it, it's become clearer and clearer is not really about the personal religious faith or habits of the individual leaders, um, and it's it's more about issues like abortion. It's more about rhetoric, um, and it's more about um, you know the alignment of. Um, of religious leaders, um, especially evangelical religious leaders, that their alignment with uh, the Republican Party institutionally. And so I think individual candidates have not been able to kind of, uh, you know, to redefine those relationships. I think those relationships have become, have become pretty uh, ingrained. When Trump came along, there were a lot of people who just assumed that the evangelicals wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. And that wasn't a, that was an unreasonable expectation, given what we, you know, what sort of people thought they knew about the importance of personal behavior and personal religious devotion to evangelical politics. But he had not only the right position on the issues, but he also had a lot of evangelical leaders who ended up sooner or later during his candidacy sort of vouching for him and endorsing him. And, and I think that, that made a lot of difference. Um, if, if some of those evangelical leaders were to start vouching for and endorsing Democratic candidates, then you know maybe that would change this, but I, I don't see that that being likely to happen. Susan, oh, thank you. Um, Um, I guess I would say that, of course, all things are possible. I mean, who would have thought that 
evangelical Protestants, white evangelical Protestants, would buy in to Trump, who wasn't a faithful spouse, who runs casinos, you know, um, and who is probably the least religiously engaged and thoughtful president we've had. We would know where to sort of start. Um, but things happen. So I totally agree with you that there could be a reversal. But given certain patterns that have been discerned over a pretty long time, the fact that there is this big sort of baby boom echo and their successors coming through who ha are now getting beyond the age when you change would we mean to say that there's as that I'm not being very clear. Um, we know that religiosity incre is increased as the cohorts get older. And as those cohorts leave um, the electorate and the pews, they are being replaced by a group that is much less religiously affiliated and religiously observant. Um, yes, there could be a reversal of those trends, of course. Um, the extent to which Immigration has changed the game, is not insignificant, and that would require a lot of change. And so, yeah, it's the the folks, the the the, the statistical modelers who have told us that were that at some point in this century, and we don't know when, we're going to be a, Christians will be a minority of the adult public because there will be an increased proportion of non-Christian um, adults as well as a, a much bigger proportion of non-affiliates are assuming that there's not going to be wholesale reversals of trends we've seen. Um, and that's where they get the confidence. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, what we are seeing so far is people who are already Christian and maybe nominally so, but already Christians who are now saying, I'm an evangelical because I'm a Republican. We're not seeing a lot of people who are going from non-belief, non-religion to Christianity. And even the Republican Party, the number of non-religious people is higher than it used to be, though obviously it's much, it's much been more of a change on the Democratic side. So that would be a new step that we haven't yet seen. I think it's possible, but um, you know, it would take um, not just, I think, that non, you know, non-religious people to sort of reconvert it into Christianity, but also probably a lot of these religious minority groups who are now mostly Democrats to switch parties into the Republican Party and then Christianize. And so, again, I, I take the point that it's hard to predict these things for sure, but that's, it would take some things we haven't yet seen at work, is, is what I, I think I'd say. Uh, I just wanted to thank you both for a terrifically informative talk. It raises so many questions. So if I understood you correctly, if it's true that an the Republican Party is becoming an increasingly religious party, and the America as a whole is becoming increasingly less religious, that suggests that the electoral fortunes of the Republican Party are going to be severely hampered which I think we may already have seen in the last congressional election when the Democrats did much better than expected. And at least many people think that had to do with the abortion decision. So uh, parties and peers of the divided nation, I have a terrible feeling that even if it were possible for the two parties to find common ground, that the single most important political and religious development in the country right now is a triumph of conservative Catholicism on the Supreme Court. And, and I think this Supreme Court would be capable, even if greater harmony found a way to express itself, to divide the country even more, because they don't face electoral consequences for their extremism. <laughs> uh, 
I guess I have to say to that what Yogi Berra said, I never make predictions, especially about the future. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I yeah, I, uh, I've lived through so many cycles of the Democrats are the next majority, the Republicans are the next majority, the Democrats are the next majority that I sort of decide, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll probably stay close. But I think it's a really interesting point about the court and about you know, what are the consequences of a, not just conservative Supreme Court, but a really religiously conservative Supreme Court, and a, um, and the transformation of the abortion issue that happened with Dobbs to the point where now it's sort of the, 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 old, the old offense is now the new defense and vice versa, and we, we've already seen some of the electoral consequences of that, as you say. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how that would play out, but I certainly agree that that is, you know, sort of it's dropping a new, you know, a, a, a new explosive, you know, into the mix um, that we didn't see before. And depending on how aggressive the court is in, in, in other areas as well, relating to religious freedom and, and um, regulation, things like that, um, that could be a major area of, uh, of partisan, a partisan dispute. And uh, yeah, the, you know, the country is certainly the, for lack of a better term, the sort of cultural elite of the country is just moving in a completely opposite direction from that. And the, and the institutions controlled by the cultural elite of the country are moving in opposite directions. So that's certainly a, a formula for, for some real, uh, real political battles. Here. Mm -hmm. my, my mic is not working. I need to do a lot. So, uh, I'm really following up on Father's first question about uh, sort of the, the, the future of the life after the abortion controversy. Because you know, it's now in the states, and there's going to be really difficult fighting uh, there. But in a few years, it's going to it's going to be all, more or less off the agenda. A lot of states are going to be very pro-abortion. A lot of states are going to be very anti-abortion, and uh, I don't think there's going to be so much to keep it on the agenda. So my question is: a, a social scientist loves the term "goal displacement." What happened? I mean, the, the activists on both sides of the abortion issue, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Yeah, both of you, I Well, I, I'm not sure it will only be a state issue. I mean, the, the, the you know, the Dobbs decision makes it possible for Congress to pass a law outlawing abortion nationwide. And, you know, or obviously, conversely, they, they could pass a law on the other side. But I mean, it, the next time there's a Republican president or a Republican Congress, obviously there's a filibuster in the Senate and, and who knows, but there's, there's very likely to be at least a, a push for national pro-life legislation. So um, when you combine that with battleground state politics where there are states where the parties will be continuing to fight, I, I do think it will be it will remain an act a very much an active partisan issue. Um, I think in terms of policy, obviously there will be states where it'll the policy will be pretty stable. But I uh, I think it's it's going to be you know, there's a, I'd be more likely to think it's it's gonna it's gonna linger for a while. I I would have to agree that I don't see this evaporating as a political issue and as a partisan issue. One of the things that I want to say about abortion as an issue is that when Roe v. Wade was decided in the early 70s, it, abortion was a hot button issue that divided people from one another, but it didn't divide people on a partisan basis. And that did not emerge if, until um, some Republican operatives like Richard Wirthland and then Vigorini figured that out and figured out that if they could draw white evangelical Protestants into the pro-life side, that wasn't their issue before. 
when Roe v. Wade was decided, the Southern Baptists didn't, didn't make a fuss about it. And that was a, a, a self-consciously political decision. Um, and it became a partisan issue. Another reason that I don't think it's going to fade away is that it affects people's lives in a day-to-day -day way. In a way, even something as hot button as guns doesn't affect people in a day-to-day -day way. Polarization so, um, at the state level is nowhere near as great as polarization. I mean, it, most states uh, are unified. Uh, they have what are called trifectas. They have uh, either all Republican or all Democratic state governments. Okay. I mean, there are fewer purple states than there used to be. Is that what you're trying to say? No, I'm trying to say at the state level, yeah. uh, the, the issue seems to be going to be more decisiveness because states tend to be very unified uh, politically. There are very few states uh, where uh, there's divided government. The whole country. That's true. Some. That's true, but I'm not sure it, it has the same implications for the politics of abortion going forward that you're drawing from that. Um, and that is another hallmark of the last roughly third of the century that it used to be that many states had, you know, divided government and few of you now did in the past. Very few. Yes, back there. Yeah, I think this is a question for Dr. Schlossman. Um, do you know any of the data on the socioeconomic uh, relations of different people who are either being drawn to religion or from religion, and then those who are Democrat, those who are Republic? Um, the one thing that I do know is that, um, as I may have mentioned, that the non-affiliated, you know, the unaffiliated are very disproportionately well-educated, white and young. And yes, there's an educational variation across um, denominations. Um, Hindus, Unitarians, and Jews are by far the best educated denominations in the country. Um, in general, mainline white Protestants, ma white mainline Protestants are better educated than white evangelical Protestants. Um, so yeah, there are differences. Ask me some more specifics, and I'll see if I can help you. Well, I guess the only reason I was asking is because I feel like there's usually um, a connection to be made between the white affluent and liberal side, and then the kind of, especially especially with like the Protestant South, there's more of an association between like the poor whites down, who are usually associated with Republicanism. They didn't know if that trend still held when we just considered the religious affiliations and don't include as much of the uh, party lines. That makes sense. Everything's messy, but there's a fair amount of overlap between class and religious affiliation. So a banker is much more likely to be an Episcopalian than in the Assemblies of God. Right. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both for your talk. I, I want to ask both of you um, to imagine that uh, you were asked to be consultants for religious leaders or religiously committed persons who were concerned about polarization in their particular traditions. This was something that they thought needed to be addressed and had a goodwill effort to try to find ways to resolve some of the, the issues of polarization in their, in their communities. What would be a couple of things that you would um, suggest uh, as uh, bits of advice for such persons? Well, a, a lot of the research about overcoming social divisions emphasizes finding cross-cutting or superordinate identities to emphasize instead, to focus on things that unite people across the different groups rather than emphasizing things that divide them. And um, 
I think that um, there's probably a useful formula there for trying to bring down some of the, the temperature on some of these things that has to do with, that has to do with the fact that um, it was more likely in the past that our different social identities cut across each other. And so your religion and your ethnic and your class and your geographic and your professional and your generational identities didn't all put you with the same people opposite the same people. And that that's become less true now. So for religious leaders who want to cultivate a feeling of, of a broader community of, of not only of believers, but of, of humans, I, I think to, to, to emphasize things that are universal human traits, values, um, virtues, and, and foibles is a much more productive way than to talk more narrowly about, well, these kinds of people are like this and these kinds of people are like that. Just to elaborate on that, um, the last time, I, and to basically say, in a sense, how profound the differences are, the last time we were really brought together as a nation is after 9-11. And color me naive, but I thought that a pandemic would bring us together. And instead, it really devolved to the fault lines of partisanship. And I have to say, I didn't see it coming, but the lesson for me was how deep the divides are. Yeah, and these divides, as I say, these divides can be stoked, though. There are people who see it to their advantage to be divisive, yes. to yes. push people against each other. And But there could be people in positions of leadership and responsibility who try to go in the up, uh, opposite way. And I think people would respond to some degree to that if they did. And it may be that um, religious leaders at the level of congregations and their pulpits could have something to do with that by, you know, a, in a variety of ways, not using their religious institutions as the infrastructure for political action, which is something we've seen historically, sometimes in ways that we find profoundly moving, like during abolitionism and especially during the civil rights movement. And, but it was, on the other side, something that was very important and doesn't get a lot of attention in the opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment in the late 1970s, that a lot of the uh, um, the folks who were uh, advocating against it had been mobilized by their their immediate religious institutions. You know, religious churches and, and synagogues and so forth have membership lists, and they have buses, and they have activists who can use a religious institution as a, a vehicle for what can become partisan politics. And maybe at the more grassroots level of congregations, uh, religious leaders can have an effect making that less common. The woman in the green sweater, I, I try to remember. Um, I'll ask you both alluded to various ways and made some specific references to ways in which the political climate has changed the experience within churches, so the different ways that people are identifying, the different constitution of some religious communities. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to what you see as, if any, the most significant theological changes that have been affected by this increasing interweaving of politics and religion. And you mentioned the issue of abortion becoming more, more significant to religious communities than maybe it had been on the basis purely of theological doctrine. I was wondering if you could elaborate more if there are other examples of that. I mean, my point about abortion was really about that it had become a, that a hot button issue that was getting people angry at each other had become partisan rather than nonpartisan. And I'm not a theologian, so this is not my main <laughs> work. Um, I'm not sure I can answer what the theological changes are in the way that I spend a lot of time thinking about the political ones. Well, maybe you can rephrase a little bit. Okay. That, that's totally acceptable. That's totally the answer. But I, I, just more thinking in terms of what you see 
if you see anything, genuinely issues that are really important to communities of religious communities, um, and if that seems to you like a consequent, I mean, to your point, of Hopkins of about uh, the politics coming into the pews the other way and the other direction, where have there been changes to the things that maybe uh, church communities prior to, say, the 1980s were more influential on, and now, you know, maybe for political reasons. That's a theological question. Let a theologian answer that, okay? Um, Thank you. Give you an example. Uh, in New York City, in the Upper East Side, a very wealthy neighborhood, there are four churches. One is the Jesuit Church in Ignatius, one is the Presbyterian Church, one is the Presbyterian Church, and one is the Disciples of Christ. They, uh, who represent very different positions on the abortion issue, you know, from the, the very conservative Catholic position to the much more open disciples of Christ. They're, they're all very affluent. The thing that unites them is that they have an immense food pantry. And what they what unites them all is they, they, they run the best food pantry for the homeless in New York City. And so what they charge, believe it or not, is when you get married in one of those churches, you have to present the bill for your reception to the church. And the church charges you 10% of your of the cost of the flowers, the food, the dance, the whole thing like that. All that money goes into the food pantry. And these churches, which are all over the place, theologically, and all over the place on hot flesh and button issues like abortion, what unites them in a very dramatic way is the service of the poor. And I think it's, it's actually a great story. There are churches exactly like that in Boston, in downtown Boston. King's Chapel, which is Unitarian, Paulus, the Paulus Center, which is Catholic, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, which is Episcopalian, they unite on a food pantry basis, and it's amazing the kind of unanimity and cooperation they have with each other on that. Which is a much more vivid way of my trying to answer your question, which is the things can happen at the congregational level if they're framed less about hot button cultural issues. Yeah, I just want to say, I, I don't have a real answer to the question, but I do say that based on my, the, the reading I've done of people who, who uh, interview pastors and things like that, that there's, there's something unique about the abortion issue as an issue in the evangelical Christianity. Um, that there are pastors who say, oh, I don't do politics in church. I don't do politics. Of course I talk about abortion. That's different. That's a different issue. That's a biblical imperative issue. I don't so do politics. I do abortion only. So there, I mean, I do think that that issue in particular has become more than any other issue a sort of a, a, a litmus test issue and an issue that is is considered to be you know non negotiable. And um, that that's just my my sense from what I've read. But I, I don't have any particular expertise in, in this area. I'm sorry to say. I want to add to that um, today. I looked around for the data about what are the views of um, two very hot cultural issues, abortion and same-sex marriage. Not of sort of religious leaders, but of the rank and file in different religious communities. And for white evangelical Protestants are the only religious group in the country that um, are opposed both to abortion and to same-sex marriage. Catholics are fairly comfortable with both issues. Um, in, you know, and main, mainline Protestants also. Um, and of course, the unaffiliated are comfortable on, on both issues. So in fact, the people in the pews are more moderate in their positions than often their clergy are. But the, the clergy are in a position of leadership. Um, over here, um, isn't the, there's, a, there's a lot of remarkable stories here, but isn't one of the most remarkable that we haven't mentioned yet the fact that um, the divisions between members of different religious communities has declined precipitously as the increasing rate of polarization on political issues has increased kind of in a reciprocal way. So I wonder, especially Professor Hopkins, based on your talk, if maybe the 
um, decline in interreligious animosity, um, as that's been coupled with an increase in polarized, uh, polarized animosity, if maybe kind of in the broader sweep of American political history, the desire to always identify an other maybe is no longer religion, but it's actually political affiliation. I wonder if there's anything there that you might be willing to say. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, if you think there's something inherent about humans wanting to categorize themselves and, you know, who's on our side, who's not like us. Um, traditionally, religion was a big way people did that. And America is actually a pretty tolerant country religiously. And we, you know, especially these days, um, there aren't that many people who really think uh, it gets tested with Islam and atheism to some extent. But certainly if you if you talk about most people don't have a problem with being friends with or married to or living near or whatever people of different uh, religions and that's um, you know something that America has I think a lot to be proud of that we've got to that point um, but yeah the, the the political animosity is is uh, is on the rise maybe as a kind of a, a replacement and you know there are people who do you know, there still is remaining people who don't who think that that the you know the 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 Republicans are a bunch of religious kooks and the Democrats are a bunch of godless communists. I mean, there still is some of that, obviously, uh, where where they're they're equating um, uh, uh, religion and politics together in a, in a way, in a dis sort of disparaging way to the other side. But in terms of actual you know overt hostility, um, you know. Well, one way to, to spin it is well, we've we've solved that we've we've solved a lot of that problem in the religious realm, and it, it's just some of it's transferred to the political realm. So I, I think that's smart. Yeah, I want to emphasize what you said. You raised something important. The original framing of my talk, which had to land on the cutting room floor, began with some comments about the U.S. as a religious outlier in comparison to the other affluent democracies with which we compare ourselves. We are a constitutionally secular state in a religious nation. And this is a very unusual configuration worldwide among rich democracies. We are characterized, even with the diminution that we talked about of religious faith and practice over the short-term history, still way more religiously faithful and practicing than our, um, our counterparts in other affluent democracies. Also, in comparison to um, other affluent democracies, we are really denominationally, denominationally diverse, and we are religiously tolerant. So um, for those of you who deal in uh, public opinion research know that the University of Michigan runs a very famous a survey every four years called the American National Election Study. And if you get selected to talk to them, they give you a whole lot of um, different groups to say, how much do you like them? What's your affect? It's called a feeling thermometer. It goes from zip to 100. And as Dave mentioned, the only religious groups that go under 50% are atheists and, and uh, Muslims. And I don't know where they are. Where, do you know where they are? That feeling thermometer in the 40s. In the 40s, okay. So we are religiously tolerant. But at the same time, we have this complicated inter intertwining of religion and politics in a nation with a constitutional prohibition on establishment, which is again pretty unusual if you look at countries in Europe, and also with a protection for free exercise. Again, not something that you get everywhere. So thank you for raising that and giving me a chance to sort of talk about the bigger picture of where we are in the order of affluent democracies. Just, just a follow up on what other people have said. Are you Professor Wolf? Oh, yeah. And what Professor Wolf said um, earlier and very much more eloquently than I'm sure I will. But um, maybe basically the bottom line. Uh, so as I look here at the pews, I think uh, of the statistics you've given us and the demographics, uh, we're going to be a less Christian nation. We're going to, um, the, 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 the religion in this nation is going to be um, 
changing, particularly because of the younger people, um, um, religion becoming increasingly less important probably. Uh, so um, it, it seems to me like if we're gonna lose um, Christianity and uh, we're gonna have a more secular uh, nation in general, if we look at the long haul, um, isn't that rock that the Republican Party is standing on going to start to go underwater? Aren't those people as well, aren't the evangelical Christians? Um, I mean, they're also being influenced by their congregations becoming younger and less affiliated. Isn't that true? Um, but uh, they seem like they have a tremendous political power at the moment, but in 10 years, will that really be the case? Uh, will the Republican Party uh, be less influenced by the evangelicals? Yeah, I just, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm wary of these, of these uh, predictions. You'll have to forgive me for that. You know, um, here's, one ex here's one example, um, Latinos, you know, um, People used to say, well, the country is becoming a lot more Latino. The number of Latinos is going way up. And so that's, oh, that's good news for the Democrats, right? Latinos vote Democrat. This is all these new Democratic voters. The younger generation is so much more Latino. That's a, that's a formula for, you know, blue wave after blue wave. But if you look what is actually happening with Latinos, as they're getting older, becoming less Democratic. And one of the reasons they're becoming less Democratic is that some of them are leaving the Catholic Church and becoming evangelical Protestants. And so, you know, we could say in the long term, yeah, these trends are maybe moving in a way of, you know, Christianity becoming weaker in, in the U.S. and maybe in the long term, among other factors, that is bad news for the Republican Party as we now stand. But there's an awful lot of elections that are going to happen before we get to that point and an awful lot of other things that can, that can happen, a lot of other realignments that can happen. So that's where I'm, you know, hesitant to make a prediction along those lines. I, I, I'm more confident in saying, I think things will change. I think things will change. I think that, you know, if we project our current political, you know, climate out into the future, we're, all, we're almost always gonna miss some things we can't predict that are gonna happen and shake things up a bit. So that's, that's all I'm, uh, that's all I'm confident. From a standpoint, though, is that more uh, likely to happen um, because of uh, differences between the haves and the have-nots, uh, between those kinds of democratic differences rather than religious, as religious influence diminishes. Uh, is that where the real question is going to be? Um, let me give a sort of long sweep of American history. What we know is that over time, the answer to who is fighting whom over what with regard to parties and elections has changed periodically. It used to be once a generation, now it's been longer, but the idea that the, the same issues that divide us today and that divide us in partisan ways are, and that align groups in partisan ways, it, it's not going to last forever. Um, and the easiest example to illustrate what's a historical pattern is just before the Civil War, we had a party alignment between the Whigs and the Democrats. And they differed with one another principally over um, economic issues. Things like, should we develop the rivers and arbors? But it was very clear that what was getting under the skin of the American people was a sectional rather than an economic conflict for slavery. And eventually, the Whigs disappeared, the Republicans replaced them, and we got a whole new alignment over an important set of issues. So there's every reason to believe that exactly the same issues that divide us today and divide us into particular groups and so forth are not going to be the permanent answer to the question of who is fighting who over what. Please join me in thanking Kay and David.